I always love reading God's Word. And I cannot recall in the last 40 or 50 years when I read a long passage out of the Bible that I didn't see something I hadn't seen before. Now, I've read Judges 4 and 5 over the years, 10, 20 more times. Every time I seem to find something new. And that is one reason why I think we call it the living word. Because there's always something to get from this. Always something new. And um, you guys have heard me use the phrase God's one-liners. There, he, he puts some, he starts in Genesis and doesn't stop to Revelation. And he's always putting these little one-liners in there to make you think. And to step back. And why does he do that? Because he wants us to get to know him. God said this was important. There may not be an answer for what he says, so the one-liner. It may be something that, it's just your opinion. It's just what you think it is. But you're sharing that with God. And you're getting to know him, and he's getting to know you. And so, I encourage you just to read the word and that becomes your study because he starts jumping out at you and the more you listen to him the more you're going to hear and it's amazing how he does it I mean, I'm an old man and I, I'm still amazed and it just brings life to me every day to just be able to hear him speak and say oh wow you missed that yeah what about this Hey, did you consider this? Wow, I got this great idea. Listen to this. That's, that's what God does for us. So let's read. We're going to read uh, selected passages. Judges 4, verses 4 through 10. Then verses 12 through 15. And then verses 1 through 7 of chapter 5. And verses 12 and 15. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah before, before, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, and with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him to your hand. Then Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours in the journey that you are about to take, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Kadesh. Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali together to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up to, with him. Deborah also went up with him. Verse 12. Then they told Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera called together all of his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people who were with him, from Harasheth Hagoyim to the river of Kishon. Deborah said to Barak, Arise, for this day, this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasheth Hagoim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not even one was left. Chapter 5. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, That the leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers. I, to the Lord, I will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked and heavens also dripped from the clouds dripped water. The mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord, at Sinai, at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, and travelers went by 
roundabout ways. The peasantry seized, they seized in Israel, until I, Deborah, rose, until I arose, a mother in Israel. Verse 12, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song, arise, Barak, and take away your captives, O son of Abinamon. Verse 15, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As was Issachar, so was Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels among the divisions of Reuben. There were great resolves of heart. In Deborah is between Bethel and uh, Ramah. Now on the map, uh, if you want to take a look at the map that's coming up, you'll find that we, we, we'll get there that it's close to Jericho. Now, if you remember, Jericho was known for its palm trees. Okay, so uh, in, the, in the geography of this, there are maybe five, eight miles maybe between Rama and uh, Jericho, and then maybe another three miles to, to Bethel. So they, back then it was a nice size distance, but uh, they were able then to, but so there was gardens and flowers, and we assume that, and what archaeologists and everything can figure out, is this was a fairly lush area, and there was a lot of gardens, a lot of flowers, a lot of plants, a lot of trees. And so I was thinking, when you see all the pictures of Deborah conducting her court, she's sitting under a palm tree. And the first thing that came to my mind, what happened at rains? What happens when it's windy? See, my picture of her sitting under the palm tree judging Israel was not that she was physically outside on a bench sitting under a tree. She was in a building conducting her civil affairs and there was a big palm tree right outside. So she was sitting under the palm tree. And, but see, those are my, some of my one-liners. Some of the things I think about and come to my mind when I'm reading is that did she really sit under a palm tree when it's 110 degrees outside? Or when it's 50 degrees, 40 degrees outside and the wind's blowing 30 miles an hour and it's, a, and it's raining? So, anyway, those are the kind of things I, that make the Bible come alive to me. Another interesting question, which I have no answer for, why did God mention her husband? What's he got to do in the story? You know, we can come up with some ideas and suppositions, but I, I, God hasn't told me yet why he put Lapidoth's name in there. Except Lapidoth sounds kind of neat to say sometimes. I don't know if I'd want to be named Lapidoth. But. And did it ever really mean anything to anybody why his name was mentioned? Just, just a thought. Then if, when you look on the map, you can't see Bethel and Rama down there, but it's about 50 to 70 miles. The map I was trying to use had such a poor, uh, what do you call that thing, legend, that I couldn't quite make out it was 50 or 70. That's a two or three day journey uh, from where Barak was. But another interesting point was when the judges were named, they all controlled a certain regional area. All the judges mentioned in Judges are regional except one, Deborah. She judged all of Israel. Barak is way up on the very far northern end of Israel. She was down near the southern edge of Israel. All of Israel came to her. She may have been the only judge in Israel before Samuel that judged the entire country. The rest were regional or provisional governors or judges. So God has said that this woman is someone to listen to. Not only today, but especially back then. In the verses 6 and 7, it says that they brought Barak to her, which was right. She was the boss. How she got her direction from God, we don't know. 
It's another one that God, you know, if you're going to give us all these details, all these little details, the girl mentioned her, her husband's name, why couldn't you tell us how you talked to her? Did she hear a voice? Was it a dream? Was it a vision? Was it a prophet? How did she get the word, how did you get the word to her? We don't know. We just know she got a word from God. She revealed it to Barak. Now, when I was younger, a lot younger, I used to think Barak was a wimp. That he wasn't really much of a man. Because he had to hide behind a woman's skirt. Well, I can't go out unless you go with me. What kind of man's that? Hiding behind a woman. When we find out, though, when you go back and look, every judge was the leader. Every judge led the army, led the opposition. If Deborah did not lead, she would be in danger of losing her respect from the people. Because why didn't Deborah lead? Why wasn't she there? She's supposed to be the boss. Eh? She's supposed to be the commander-in-chief. She's supposed to be the one that's been leading and guiding us. Where was she? I believe Barak understood that. Barak also was a humble man. Because he says, I don't care. if I, I don't, I'm not going to deserve the glory. You're the law boss. You're the leader. You're the judge. You're the one God has chosen. You deserve to get the recognition and the glory and the honor for winning this battle. Not me. I'm just your servant. And what a difference it made to see Barak in that way instead of, oh, well, I'll go if you go. <laughs> and then hers, in verse 10, it says, and then Barak returned got the 10,000 men, went out to face the enemy, and Deborah was with him. Deborah led. Verses 12 to 15, we find that the victory is won. That Deborah's there. She gives, I'm, I'm sure she gives a rousing speech before they go out on the battlefield, and off they go, and they win the war. And then in chapter 5, it's celebration time. It's time to get it on. Time to party. We've won. We're going to celebrate. And so in verses 1 through 7, it, she's echoing that. She's voicing that time of celebration. The time that they conquered the enemy. Then in verse 15, she lets us know that we're united. Even there could have been a lot of dissension. I think something we, we may, and I think I've missed until now, is that only two tribes provided soldiers. There's some reference that they may have, a couple of the other tribes may have given either support, logist, logistic support, or some other kind of support. But most of them just says, eh, that's a regional problem. Let, let them take it. Not the Indians, let them take care of it. It's their problem. We're over here, we've got our own set of problems. We don't need to take on theirs. That could have divided the country. That could have destroyed the nation of Israel right there. Deborah's not going to allow that to happen. She's going to let the two tribes that did the fighting celebrate and take the glory and ha, hallelujahs, and be freed from oppression. But she's not going to allow them to point the finger at their brothers and saying, why didn't you help? Where were you? She's not going to allow that dissension. Something that you, we may miss in this story is her ability to keep the country together when it could have fallen apart. Because how often does that happen in churches? When one group does something and another group doesn't, and they, they split because they're upset because one either did or didn't do something. Nah. Deborah was strong enough to hold that country together. 
Now, in the side story, there was a side story to this of another woman. And I, I blame a women's group back in the 90s who taught me about the red tent. And now every time I read tent and a woman, I assume it's a red tent. In this story, we don't know what kind of tent Jael, Jael is in. It's her own personal tent. Because they were wealthy, she, and she was an adult, she may have actually had her own tent. Because remember, families lived together in one tent. Except for that week of the month, when a woman is on her, having her menstrual cycle, she has to live apart from the rest of the family because she's unclean. So, the, so what they did was they had a tent and it was typically made of red fabric that she would live in during that period of time. When you read the Genesis account of Rachel and her hiding the household idols from Laban, that is the tent they're talking about. Why no man would go in there and search the tent? Because they would be defiled. They would be unclean. Now, Barak goes into that tent later. But remember, Barak was already defiled. He was already unclean because he killed somebody. <laughs> he had been in contact with the dead. So he was already dirty and unclean. So he could go in and see the dead body of Sisera and not have to worry about it. It may have just been, like I said, the wealthiness of the wealthy, the wealth of the family, she had her own tent, or it could be the red tent. You can put your spin on it, and it kind of just embellishes the story a little bit, whichever way you look at it. But Jael became famous because of her actions. The character of Deborah. I, I think I got nine. I can't remember. I don't count them. I just list them off and write them down. Here's what I think. So you may have more than I've come up with. But one of the things that Terry shared with me first, she said, well, you know what? I didn't say how wise she was. Well, she was a wise woman. I mean, that was kind of assumed, right? Because how could you be a judge of a, of a nation if you have no wisdom? She was also respectful. She respected who Barak was. She respected her position, his position, and the people's position. She was definitely a leader. She was faithful. She listened to God. She obeyed God. But she was also persuadable. She was content to stay in between Bethel and Ray Ray Raymond. And let Barak go and fight the war. But when Barak made his argument with her, she was persuaded. She didn't have to always have to have it her way. She didn't have to be the final word. She didn't have to be the one that's right. She didn't have to... She was amenable. She was persuadable. She was brave. Even though it wasn't much danger where she was for the battlefield, there was still that danger... That if Israel would have been overrun, she would have probably been captured and killed. So she had bravery. She went with the army to lead them. She was forthright. She didn't pull punches. She told it like it was. She was honest. Well, Barak, <laughs> I go up there, you're just going to be a footnote. I'm going to be the headline. And he says, Great. Be the headline. She was adaptable. She was able to go from sitting in a nice room and passing judgments to getting out on a battlefield and leading a bunch of soldiers. And the one thing that I, I ended up with when I got down to the end of chapter 5, I realized how loyal she was. She gave her life for her people. She dedicated herself to her people. 
sing with glory, shout out Israel. Mend this country. Don't let us be divided. Don't let us be separated. Don't let us be joined, torn asunder because of pettiness. We are going to stand together and we're going to be loyal to one another as I am loyal to you, as I am loyal to God, and God is loyal to us. Deborah has a lot to teach us. She's someone who we need to be a sister, have as a sister. We need to spend time with her. Admire her. Emulate her. And be like her. So that we can be wise, respectful, lead, be faithful. Not be locked in, not be unmovable, but persuadable. Be brave forthright. Adapt to the situation that you're in and be loyal to one another to the Lord. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray and have the team, a worship team come up. We'll sing our closing song and we're going to invite you to respond in any way. If you need prayers from the church, you need to make a confession, you want to accept the Lord, whatever your needs may be that we can help you with as a family, then we invite you to come as we stand and sing as soon as we pray. Father, thank you for Deborah. Thank you for Terry. Thank you for all those who serve at this church. Thank you for those who were here this morning. And Father, may your word have fallen on a fertile soil. And may the things that have been said and done in this congregation today be in accordance with your will to your glory. For all this we pray through Jesus. Amen.